Hello, it's APED Helsinki again, and I have here two people this time. I have uh, Monica Posada Sanchez and Mark Boyd, and you're going to tell us something very interesting about APIs and digital government. But before that, how have you coped this remote times that we are living, Mark? Uh, me. Um, uh, hey everyone, it's good to be with you all. Um, so I'm back in Barcelona. I've just flown in recently from New York. So uh, I was in the process of trying to build up time in New York and now um, that's off the table completely. So my year is looking very different. I'm back in New York and uh, I'm still in quarantine for another um, few days. So it looks sunny outside, but I haven't gone out yet to be able to appreciate it. Yeah, I think that that is a very wise decision given the location. How about you, Monica? Any quarantines for you? Well, uh, I have a um, very nice story. So um, when the lockdown started in Italy, um, I decided when, when it was not that strict, I decided that I was going to go uh, to my in-laws uh, to, to, to be capable of, of working while, while um, I had my children at home. Uh, and the, the very same day that we arrived, we were said that we couldn't get back. And uh, I, have had, I have been in my in-laws' place for more than three months now with the luggage for 10 days. So it's been quite an, a particular <laughs> situation for us as well. But still, it's, everything has is, is, is been very nice and uh, I really can't complain for, for that, actually. So you have to just uh, kind of tell yourself all the time that you are still on the holiday, like two, two weeks Kind holiday, of, yes. I, I only have one work right now. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not <laughs> two full-time jobs. <laughs> I think yeah. I think we're all um we're all just wearing the same clothes three or four days in a row anyway. So we're <laughs> yeah, probably yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to I have to confess on that. And I just hate when everybody wants you to turn on the camera and then I have to do all these pre recording sessions <laughs> with the camera like think about that. But yeah, it is a pleasure to have you here, even though it's virtual this time. And now I, I can't wait to hear about APIs and government. Monica, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. The pleasure is indeed ours. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to, to thank uh, APA Days Helsinki for uh, giving us the opportunity to present um, our study um, in this very fresh virtual uh, format. Um, my name, as I said, is Monica Posada. I am a research fellow of the Digital Economy Unit at the Joint Research Center in Italy. And uh, I am currently uh, leading the, the API team uh, in this um, organization. So um, uh, I'm going to, so, so I am here also with, uh, with Mark Boyd. Uh, Mark is um, our um, ex uh, on APIs, um, expert consultant on uh, API infrastructures. He's been helping us for uh, for a long time on uh, trying to set up a context of uh, uh, for API adoption in in government. And uh, we will together present uh, the output of um, of the um, study that we've been running for the last two years. And some other studies that we are going to um, to uh, to launch uh, in the in, in, in the near future. So, um, um, in a nutshell, uh, the APIs for digital government study uh, has analyzed the relevance of APIs in the context of the digital transformation of government, specifically. The study has uh, analyzed the value, opportunities, and challenges that the adoption of APIs bring to, um, to, to, to the government, uh, so the why. Uh, it has also evaluated the current status of adoption in government, of API adoption in government, so the what. And uh, it has proposed a potential roadmap uh, for a coordinated adoption of APIs in government structures. Distilled, distilled uh, from the thorough, uh, the thorough analysis of a sentence practice uh, uh, literature. So the how. Um, so why APIs matter? Um, APIs are the technical enablers of the digital transformation. Um, 
in, in the sense that uh, they are actually the connective tissue of the digital society. No more, but no less. Uh, the vast majority of data exchange in the digital uh, era happens through APIs. Um, but still, APIs are uh, only a tiny little bit of the puzzle. Uh, without digital assets behind, so data and functionality, APIs are nothing. And uh, without applications that integrate them and make them uh, human consumable in one way or another, they are nothing. So uh, indeed, APIs are necessary, but uh, not sufficient. So why is that uh, uh, we need, I mean, the, the, the European Commission is now putting an eye um, uh, on the policy relevance of these uh, technical solutions. Uh, the main reason, the, re the, the three main reasons that we've, un uh, that we've identified are uh, the hyper-connectivity demand. So, um, Digitization is making everything connected to everything. Uh, in, this, uh, in this context, APIs, uh, given the fact that they are connectors, um, are actually the technical enablers of, 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 the, um, of, the, digital, of, of the creation of, of digital environments. Uh, the second um, perspective is the flexibility and agility demand. So uh, technologies advance a very fast pace. Data is the new electricity. You can power a plethora of digital products. Most of them are not even yet uh, developed. Uh, so solutions, technical solutions need to be flexible enough to get new data sources, to integrate new data sources and new functionalities. And um, given that APIs are modular, reusable, and easily scalable, this gives, uh, this provides flexibility to ICT infrastructures um, and, and put it in, a, in, in another level. The third uh, main reason why uh, APIs have policy relevance is that uh, APIs are doors to digital infrastructures. So um, the security and resilience of digital environments will also depend on the robustness of their I, I, API infrastructures. And therefore, organizations need to take care of this aspect. Um, so uh, the policy relevant, uh, as, as I said, of the APIs is linked to the capacity to provide flexible access to digital assets, and to um, the connectivity role that they have uh, to connect uh, both actors and systems. So um, in this sense, we've identified two main, uh, two main uh, aspects why uh, APIs are relevant to the digital transformation of government. Uh, one is public uh, administration innovation, and the second one is uh, Policy making innovation. Uh, so, the first one, public uh, regarding the public administration innovation, APIs strategies. APIs strategies can support organizational change management along their transformation processes. We have evidences. We have found evidences of public organizations at national, region, and local levels that are assessing their digital maturity by measuring different uh, technical and organizational aspects by measuring uh, certain metrics on their API infrastructures. Um, moreover, APIs uh, facilitate flexible, effective, inclusive, accountable public service provisions. We have plenty of evidences. Um, <clears throat> Uh, on, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this way, for instance, uh, the region of Lombardy um, has, has managed to uh, cross-fertilize several of the public services uh, with um, data coming from internal and external actors such as, uh, for example, they have a, a digital ecosystem created around uh, tourism and mobility data. Um, the same organization has improved the efficiency of the emergency response uh, services by integrating different systems through APIs. Um, 
they have even uh, set up uh, innovative services that are capable to um, integrate old technologies with the new ones and make the transition between the old technologies and the new ones uh, adaptive thanks to um, API flexibility. Uh, the third main reason why APIs are relevant for public administration innovation is that they enable government uh, interactions, both internal and, external, and with external actors. For instance, we have uh, uh, an example of how uh, an Airbnb platform is uh, sending information about um, the, the, the hosting of uh, apartments and rooms directly to the tax office of Denmark so that um, citizens do not have to bother about how to manage uh, the income uh, that, that gets from, from them. I will quickly go through, uh, through the cost, uh, through, through, the, through a couple of slides um, that uh, will explain the goods and the bads of the, the, the adoption of APIs at organizational level. So indeed, the adoption of APIs at organizational level will imply a certain cost. So um, they come from the, 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 the fact that implementing the whole of government platform mission implies costs at different uh, uh, the managerial levels. They, need, they will need to re-engineer re uh, existing systems. And uh, most of all, there will have to be a cultural change to, to uh, and acquire new, new skills for, for its uh, realization. Uh, the main challenges that uh, have been uh, uh, mentioned by, by, by uh, many of the, 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 the analysis that we've done is that uh, there is um, a need to understand how to adhere to, to current legislation, for instance, the adoption of GDPR. Uh, there is a need to increase political awareness of the usefulness of APIs for, for uh, or government organizations. And indeed, there is a, a need to, to understand also the, the implications on, on, on resilience, security, and safe, safety related to APIs um, vulnerability. Uh, the main uh, benefits and opportunities for government organizations that we've identified can be um, um, clusterized in four main uh, aspects. So we've observed that uh, APIs improve access to public sector data. Uh, they make it more agile and flexible, the, the, the data sharing and reuse. Uh, it makes uh, also uh, triggers the quality uh, improvement uh, processes. Uh, secondly, uh, we've observed that APIs foster innovation. Uh, it also um, improves efficiency gains and uh, enable indeed uh, the creation of digital ecosystems. And uh, uh, as opportunities, uh, we have observed that API systems can help to stimulate um, enter uh, entrepreneurship, uh, also to, to help uh, uh, firms to reduce the, the, the bureaucratic barriers to running their business. Uh, we've also observed that there are um, profit generation by partners and stakeholders of API um, uh, infrastructures. Uh, and uh, that um, we, we've also started observing some, some trends on new ways to fund uh, uh, ICT infrastructures, like co-funding between different actors and co-payment models and so on and so forth. Uh, the main reports that we have produced under our studies are four. So uh, we have one, two technical reports. The first one on, on a, a standards so uh, on, on API standards and, and uh, the European Commission initiative. Um, the main report is uh, the, the tunnel in public sector digital transformation with API. Um, where, where we explain the, the, the why, what, and how um, APIs um, support the digital transformation of government. And the uh, last but not least, 
we have defined a roadmap for uh, coordinated adoption of APIs, a framework of, uh, of, of actions that, uh, that will help design uh, strategies to, to adopt APIs at, at, at a, in a cohesive uh, fashion. And now I, I leave the floor to, um, to Mark. He will explain uh, his work on, on, on this um, uh, effect. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Monica. Uh, so we'll, I'll just speak briefly around that final part that Monica described, so the API frameworks. So this is a coordinated approach for governments as far as how they can implement APIs. And it was created through a series of workshops that actually started um, at API Days Helsinki last year. We had our first workshop, um, and we, then we've held a number throughout um, the year as while well, we also collected the research that Monica's described. The, what we want to look at is the, though, um, part of what Monica was saying as well is that it involved that API programs or API strategies within government involve a whole range of um, stakeholders. So internally, you have a policy maker who might be involved with um, a stat writing some sort of policy. So for example, at the European Commission level, it could be something like the Green Deal at a uh, regional level. So again, if we keep going with the um, uh, Lomb uh, Lombardia region in Italy, as an example, they're regional government. So every three years, they write a, 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 a strategic plan for what they want to achieve with their um, current uh, uh, government, uh, elected government. Um, uh, and then you've got like, you know, even like departmental plans, and then you've got agency plans within departments and all of the rest. So you've got that policymaker role. You've got a digital government lead or a, a, a chief information officer type lead. You've got a technology lead, so a chief technology officer, or even someone like at the head of an API program or a software architect. And then you've got the API developer as well. Um, some uh, also in that um, CTO role, we're going to park um, product managers as well, which is sort of a newish sort of role. We're not seeing it being fully implemented across governments as yet. But if we're learning from best practices from industry, then you would want some uh, API product managers in there in some form or another suited to the government structure. The API framework works at three levels. I'd fir so first I want to describe these yellow boxes on the side. So that it's the API framework that we came up with. The whole idea is that what we're trying to do is help governments to be able to implement APIs as part of their work. But the challenge is that um, there's already a number of activities going on within government. So they've already built the weather API. They've already built the transport API. They've got new strategies coming out with the Green Deal that might be about a circular economy and product information or whatever. Um, and how would you then do, uh, how do you introduce APIs into that area while also continuing your work with your weather and your um, transport APIs that are more established? So our idea with the framework is that you should be able to continue doing all of those activities, but also take a step back and look at how you can better um, coordinate and provide like a cohesive, cohesive approach to all of your APIs. And the way to do that is you look at, first of all, at the strategy level. So that's sort of mostly a whole of government level. And here you're really asking, you're not able to set the requirements. So instead you actually just be, it's a fact but finding mission. So you're actually trying to find out, okay, how do we make policy? What is our vision of a platform for the whole of government? What are our uh, governance structures? And do we need any specifically that are going to take on um, overseeing of the APIs? What are our guiding principles? So often governments will have um, digital service standards, for example, that can be used as principles. And it's great to see that user-centered design is becoming um, increasingly one of those sorts of principles that's being used. So, the, so you can see on the left-hand side, the, that sort of strategic level is determined by the policy maker, often outside of an API environment, first of all. So then the CIO type person, the digital government lead type person will come along and they need to understand what, those, um, what, that, API, what that strategic layer looks like. And then they can start moving into the API tactics level. And this level is more about planning and uh, planning, allocating uh, resources and deciding how you're going to organize 
your staff, your budgets, your time to be able to deliver on your um, strategic sort of goals. Um, and then finally, you've got the API operations level. And that's really where we see currently the bulk of the activity. And this is where um, an individual team might build that weather API and then be measuring the um, performance metrics and all of the rest. But um, so, so those sorts of operational levels is how do we deliver the APIs on a day by day basis. So with this framework, we're trying to take you back a step and actually start, try to look more cohesively at like, okay, what's the overarching framework? How does this, how does the weather API help us achieve our um, strategic and our policy goals? So yes, there is the need in the weather department, there might be the need for um, delivering a weather API and keeping uh, data consistent. But if you actually look up at the strategic layer, you might see that there's some goals around making sure there's consistent data around um, uh, around climate impacts and extreme weather events for um, safety of people during, uh, you know, if there's an emergency, uh, if there's an extreme weather crisis in your um, uh, government area. So in that case, the weather API people will be like, oh, okay, that's out of our, you know, that, that's not somewhere that we were previously involved with, but maybe we can actually uh, work with them, let them know that this API exists, and we can then start measuring whether or not the weather API has meant that we can improve our emergency response management for those sorts of issues because we've got that, you know, because we're connecting up the data. So it moves you much more towards the, um, some of the, so achieving some of those benefits that Monica's described as far as the value that you're trying to get out of government APIs. So along with the strategic of, of those three layers, we also then have four pillars. So the first is that, um, uh, uh, that API activities should be guided by policy. So at the strategic level, it's about, okay, what are your policy goals? So those things like extreme weather or climate change or Green Deal or um, COVID, uh, COVID um, and reopening cities goals, all of those sorts of things, they will be at, the, um, AP, uh, at that strategic level. And the policy question becomes what the sort of API first question. Can APIs help us achieve those policy goals? And if they can, then we move into the, the tactics and the operations. Okay, what out of that, those do we need to prioritise? How are we going to measure that they're going to be um, achieving those benefits? And then at the operational level, okay, let's measure them then. And then, so, so that's the policy pillar. Then for platforms and ecosystems, um, here the goal is about leveraging platforms and ecosystems effectively. So the way you're going to build your platforms and ecosystems is going to be how is going to be what makes the API work successful. So we're seeing some governments see platform as meaning internal. So they want to be able to share resources like that uh, national identification service. They want to share that across departments. So their vision is very much like um, internal to government. We want to have these services and then we want to have each department using these common services. And that's our platform vision. Other ones like, um, again, Lombard Lombardi, uh, which we've worked with a bit on some of these examples, which is why we bring it up. But you can see the examples with um, uh, France, with their API agro platform, uh, working with agriculture partners. Um, you can see it with Italy, which is defined uh, something like 17 external ecosystems that they want to work with. Uh, Finland with the transport and um, they've got a number of, uh, and the community services API that they've yeah. um, So what we're seeing is so governments, some governments are choosing an internal pl uh, platform approach where they see it about connecting different um, government departments to use common APIs. And then you see some with a vision where it's about working in partnership with external stakeholders. So, um, uh, so areas where you've got um, the, the, you've got a transport ecosystem that involves your internal departments, plus your uh, public transport operators, plus private businesses like rideshare or scooters uh, uh, and so forth. So you've got some 
some governments are defining that platform and that ecosystem as being broader than just themselves and others are saying, no, no, we just, we've focused on our internal environment at first. And then once you know that though, then you're able to harmonize your platform and ecosystem assets. And in our framework, we strongly recommend a user-centered approach. So you will get your ecosystem together uh, you get all the transport people around the table and then you say, okay, what are the key use cases? So public transport, uh, route planning, you know, might be one that they come up with. Then maybe there's, you know, and again, because the um, alignment with policy, maybe it's about reducing traffic congestion or reducing CO2 emissions from transport as well. Um, but whatever the use cases are, then you can say out of those use cases that are the priority, okay, how will... Um, what are the common elements, elements we'll need? So we'll need some um, public transport APIs. We will need to have some data on um, air quality. You know, we will need to know, uh, we need to have all of the data sets on where the bus stops are, where the um, taxi ranks are, where, where the car parking is, you know. So then out of that, you sort of end up building all of the, those platform components, a data model that everyone can agree on. Um, so uh, a, a glossary of terms for your data, um, you might, your, the, your shared services assets. So things like, you know, the transport API that could be used for a multiple um, number of use cases. Um, and then you can sort of work on all of your other sort of, um, uh, architecture and infrastructure sort of um, platform components there as well. And then at the operational level, you're actually building those components and making sure that um, they all work together. Uh, the third pillar is governance, or is people. And so there we're recognizing that none of this will get done unless you have people um, with the skills and with the structures to be able to help them implement APIs. And so at the strategic level, that's about setting up the governance structures so that as APIs are built by um, either agencies within a department or by whole departments, that you can make sure that they're constantly going to be interoperable, consistent in their design, that they're not a security risk, that they're only making certain things available to, depending on, um, uh, depending on, um, uh, permission controls, all of those sorts of things are done then at that strategic level as far as oversight. You've got cross-competency teams at a tactical level. So a department will organise for product managers, um, po a policy influence to be involved. You might not have the policy maker, but you've got someone who understands the policy and is reporting back to the policy makers. Um, and then you've got the, the technical team and then you've got the... Um, uh, uh, you've got the actual engineers as well. So you've got all of those sorts of cross competency teams working together um, with skills like design skills. It's a, a lot of the skills, yes, you need your API skills there, but more importantly, you need your design first skills. So um, building for user need, uh, you need really strong skills in collaboration. How is this team going to be able to work across um, siloed departments to be able to discuss the benefits of APIs and be able to work with um, other government departments. So those departments are using your APIs, that sort of thing. And then at the operational level, you've got, you know, the actual team doing the work, reporting, and, you know, you've, you've got them in place. And then finally, the last pillar is the processes pillar. And this is about how do we do things within government? Um, and so it's about using best practices to guide the work. So at the strategic level, like I was saying earlier, it's about having the processes guided by core principles. So often that's the digital, digital services standards that you might have at the European Commission level. You've got the e-government um, stand uh, principles that were decided in, at Tallinn, in fact. So um, thanks, uh, Finland, again, for that sort of thing. Or is that Estonia? Um, so the, so in any case, um, uh, you've got those guiding principles. Then at the tactics level, you've got, you can follow an API product approach. So you're making sure that it's not just engineering. It's also about making sure you've got, um, uh, that there's some feedback loops as far as how it's being used and you're monitoring for that. And then you're actually adopting a life cycle approach at an operational level. So that's sort of our API framework that we came out with. And we've got a report that covers each of those in detail and describes how each of the, um, uh, what the best practices are, what the 
uh, resources are available if you want to follow this sort of thing. And then also how to determine whether to pursue this or your current API activity. So the whole idea is that this doesn't take you, it doesn't mean you throw away your current API activities, but if you're going to you're, if you're going to try to reorient towards doing this more cohesively suddenly one like suddenly for example the governance structure might need to you might need to work on all of that so suddenly that becomes more important than updating your, your weather api first you know like let's get the governance right so that will impact on your um current api activities if you're um reviewing this from within government uh, so, and then finally I'll end the, on this uh, slide. So the way we sort of see it is you start here on the left, you'd read the framework guidelines. So you might read that step around um, uh, aligning APIs with policy goals. Then the, the, um, the report will give you the best practice literature that talks about, okay, how have other governments done that? We've then got a self-assessment checklist where you can go through and say, see where your gaps are for your own uh, government. Pardon me, that gives you feedback around like where, how you score on that self-assessment checklist and suggests what you need to focus on for change management. You can then put in place some metrics to measure how well you're progressing along moving to, uh, moving to be more, um, uh, in this case, aligned with uh, between your APIs and your policy goals. And then you can go back and you can start with um, the second one as well. So that's the overall workflow. So I think that's, I've taken up all my time. Um, I hope I haven't gone over Monica, but so I'll leave you to wrap up. All right, thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, so then we are gonna skip uh, these um, um, slides and uh, we are gonna jump uh, so to the, um, to the next uh, activity, to the next uh, activities that the team is going to be uh, uh, busy with in the coming uh, in the coming year. Um, so, as a continuation of the APIs for digital governance study, uh, the the APIs for IPS, so uh, API Strategy Center for Innovative Public Services, Innovative Public Service. Um, will investi further investigate technical and organizational um, essentials of the adoptions of API in government. Um, so technically the focus will be on uh, API discoverability, API lifecycle management, and security and privacy aspects. Organizationally, the study will analyze legal and organizational aspects of APIs, for example, the transfer of responsibility and service agreements. Uh, this project is framed also under the API, the IPS action of the ISO Square program of, uh, of DigiDigit, also in the European Commission, and has uh, three, uh, three main objectives. Um, to develop set of guidelines to manage APIs in governments, including uh, versioning, change management, and API discoverability, uh, to describe a set of available solutions to manage security and privacy, and uh, to develop a set of guidelines to manage legal and organizational aspects of APIs. Um, so, uh, and uh, I want to introduce also one of the, uh, the first activities that uh, has been launched within this project. So my team also with the help uh, of, of, um, of uh, Mark has developed um, a self-assessment tool uh, based on the uh, proposed API framework that, uh, that Mark has just uh, presented to us. Uh, this tool has two main objectives. Um, on one side, it wants to support organizations to evaluate the level of maturity uh, related to API adoption. And uh, on the other side, it, 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 it has also a research objective, which is um, for us to, to obtain relevant information about what is the real status of the digital transformation of organizations around Europe. Um, we will make it public uh, very, very soon, um, and we will uh, welcome everyone to 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 try to to self-assess on on the um, API adoption state status. Um, having said so, um, I will just uh, 
uh, encourage you to, to get in contact with us and, and drop us an email uh, if you want to get access to these uh, self-assessment tools. And um, also, if you want to collaborate and, and if you think that you can provide us a relevant input uh, to, to our activities, we, we more than welcome your, um, your, uh, your contribution. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you also, Mayuka and, uh, and Mark, for, for... But hey, thank you, uh, Mark and Monica. And let's wrap this up. Thanks.